the last several weeks, we, we've started a, a series where we're walking through what's known as the Beatitudes, the, these 10 verses in the book of Matthew that come along when Jesus preached the very first public sermon that he ever gave. And it's crazy what he does because he takes all the expectations, what's normal, what's common, and he flips it upside down and says, I don't want you to be this way. I want you to live this way as my people, as followers of mine. Here's what I mean. Most of the time, you know, the, the common, common world says success is all about how much you get, that you do whatever it takes to elevate yourself, make it all about you. Lie, cheat, steal if you have to, but that's all okay because it's all about getting what's yours, getting what you feel that you deserve, whatever that looks like in this life. That can be a career. It can be in your bank account. It can be in relationships. It is ultimately all about what you feel as though you deserve from this life. And then suddenly Jesus comes along when the world says, the strong survive. The assertive push themselves to the forefront. Make sure you're noticed. And we do that in almost every area of life. I mean, think about it. From the time somebody is, starts school as a child, they get categorized and qualified. This, this person is in the gifted program. This person isn't. This person um, is on the, the select all-star team. This person's not that good. And, and we do that all the way through adulthood. Everybody is, everybody is being judged and rated. And the best get all the rewards while everybody else, they just don't. And we're told that in order to be one of the best, you have to make sure that you stand out. That's the only way you get anything in this life. That's what society says. And then in the middle of a, a, a world like that, Jesus comes along and says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. That's what Matthew 5, 5 says. That's the verse we're going to be talking about today. But I don't know about you. I've never seen that category. I've never seen that grouping. Okay, all the meek ones, you all go here. And I've never, certainly never seen anyone rewarded because they've been considered meek. Because we often, we don't think of meek as anything good. That's the wallflowers, the shy ones, the ones who are afraid of everything, that don't speak up. They're, they're just too meek, too timid. And you have to understand, this was so shocking, so revolutionary to the audience that Jesus was speaking to. They had spent hundreds of years in captivity, being oppressed, being just held down as the nation of Israel. And now they were waiting. They were in this season where they were waiting for this promised deliverer. For centuries, it had been foretold that a Messiah was coming. Somebody was going to break off the shackles and somebody was going to help elevate them to their rightful place, a place that they felt they deserved. Now, what they were expecting was a military leader. They were expecting a, a great military general to come in and throw off the Roman government with power. And then suddenly they would be in charge. That's what they'd been waiting for because that's what they had been told was coming. This guy that was going to have the keys to the kingdom, and they were with him, were going to rule the world. That, that was the plan. That was the expectation. You know how in almost every great, like, epic war movie, there's always that big battle scene. Usually it's, it's the climax of the movie, and it's, it's where everything kind of comes to resolution. The good guys win. The bad guys get defeated. But there's always that one moment right before the big battle where all of the, all of the, the guys, all the, the fighters 
are lined up somewhere. They may be standing there. They may be on horses. They, whatever. And then the leader, the guy in charge, goes around and makes that epic speech that inspires them, that, that gets them ready to go take on the enemy. That's what I imagine the people thought was about to happen when they gathered to hear Jesus speak. Remember, this was the first time he had ever publicly taught anything. So I'm sure a lot of them were saying, okay, this is the moment where he's going to unleash his plan, where he's going to let us know what he's really here to do, and we're going to be part of it. After all, we're his people. This is the one we've been waiting for, the Messiah, the one who's going to deliver us, the one who's going to break the shackles that have been holding us in prison for, for centuries. And this is that moment where it all starts. The revolution begins here. And Jesus has them gathered. And they're expecting this leader. And here's his big motivational, inspirational talk. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm thinking we're getting ready for a fight and the leader comes along, the guy that I've thought was going to usher in that, that season, and he tells me this, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. That, that's your pump-up stuff? I'm supposed to be able to get behind that? Because it makes no sense. But the truth is, as Jesus shares it, it makes absolute sense. It shows perfectly well how Jesus is going to accomplish what he accomplishes. Because here's the bottom line. And here's what's going to change everything and reframe this whole conversation for us is to understand that meekness does not equal weakness. Meekness does not equal weakness. A lot of times we get those confused. We say a meek person is a weak person because they kind of fade into the background. But the truth is, I'll help you understand the difference. A weak person can't do anything. A meek person can, but chooses not to. And so that's why a great definition of meekness is this, power under control. That's what Jesus was. He is the perfect example of power under control. Look what the writer of Proverbs says, how he describes the attitude. He says in Proverbs 16, it says, better to be patient than powerful. Better to have self-control than to conquer a city. Or in Proverbs 25, it's phrased this way. Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. See, gentleness always uses its resources appropriately. It's power under control. It's not like someone who just responds out of emotion and, and just goes off every time they get super excited or super upset. Those out-of-control emotions, Jesus is setting it up to let us know that those have no place in the life of a believer. We're not supposed to respond like that. We're not supposed to respond in anger. Why? Because as believers, we're under the control of the Holy Spirit. And we should be able to live as people who are Holy Spirit controlled. Because see, the Bible celebrates meekness all throughout the scriptures, especially in the New Testament. When Jesus talks about what does it look like to, to live as a believer, he, he says it in a whole lot of different ways. He says the last is first. Giving is receiving. Dying is living. Losing is finding. The least is the greatest. Meekness is strength. See, all those things that, that seem counterintuitive, they seem backwards, but that's the point. Jesus is trying to help us understand that what our culture says 
should make us happy. What our culture says we need about doing, be about doing is completely the opposite from what God says. Because the truth is, meekness is ultimately us being like Christ. When, when we live with meekness, we're doing just what Jesus did. Multiple times in the book of Matthew, Jesus was described as meek. Now, nobody would ever describe Jesus as weak, but the Bible says that he was meek. He's called the, the Lamb of God, but he's also called the Lion of Judah. Tough, but gentle. Power under control. That's the definition of meekness. And here's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean you shrink back and you hide from everything. Jesus made it very clear. When he saw injustice, he acted. There was a time we have recorded in Scripture where Jesus discovered that there were money changers in the temple and they were cheating people. They were ripping people off. Now, he didn't just stand by and say, oh, too bad. We know that he went in and he flipped the tables and he kicked them out and he made it right. He did something about it. That injustice stirred him to action. See, meekness has nothing to do with a Christ follower's reaction to injustice toward others. We are taught in Scripture that when we see injustice, when we see oppression, when we see those who can't help themselves be taken advantage of, as believers, we're told we should act. We should not stand by and let people who can't d respond to be hurt. In, in all walks of life, the orphans, the widows, the, the oppressed, every, every category we're told to, to do something as believers. And meekness says that just like Jesus responded justly, that we respond in a Christ-like way when we see injustice happen toward others. Now, now, here's where it gets difficult. What meekness has to do with is our response toward injustice toward us. See, that, that's the hard part. Injustice toward others stirred Jesus to action. It should stir us to action. But injustice toward himself brought out the meekness of Jesus. Look what it says in Isaiah 53. This is talking about Jesus. It said, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Injustice came to Jesus. He was innocent. And yet the religious people of his day couldn't handle the stuff he was teaching, the stuff he was doing. He rocked their world so much, they had to end it. They, they couldn't handle it. So what did they do? They put him to death. They crucified him. He didn't deserve that. But yet, even in the face of that, he said nothing. He willingly allowed himself. Remember, he's, he's God. He could have stopped it at any point. But in meekness, he allowed himself to do and to, to be treated in a way that he didn't deserve for my sake and for your sake. And see, in Matthew and other places, Jesus talked about us as his followers being lights in the darkness, being a city on a hill. What he's, what he's saying is that he doesn't want us to meekly shrink back and hide in our building away from everything going on in the world. That we're, we're not to retreat and hide out and, and hope that the broken, sinful condition of our world do, doesn't permeate our space. He's actually saying just the opposite. He wants us to be all out up in it. In the right way as Jesus modeled. See, meekness is not staying in the shadows, trying to pretend nothing is wrong, trying to hope it never directly impacts me. 
the way Christ modeled meekness, his example for us is to be the light in the darkness, to be the example of the right kind of change that's needed, to show love to a society, here's where it gets hard, that just wants to hurt us. To be able to be silent when the persecution is directed at us for doing right. That, that's the key. If we respond the way Christ wants us to, the world is not going to like it. But then that gives us the ability to be the Christ-like example when, like Jesus did, we don't try to defend ourselves for doing the right thing. And, and that's ultimately what this boils down to. God hasn't called us to try to argue people into thinking the way that we think about spiritual things, about the Bible, or anything like that. Our calling is to show Jesus to a, a hurting, lost, and dying world. And what Jesus has done is he's taken what was normal to say, look, everybody gets the strong survive, that if you want something to change, you go and fight, 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 and you remove anybody that steps in your way until you get the result you want. Everybody gets that. That makes sense, that if you're the strongest, you win. You'll get it done, no matter what it is. But Jesus didn't say that. He didn't say only the strongest will inherit everything. He said, blessed are the meek, they get it all. And it doesn't compute to, to our worldly values. And it was never meant to. So how do we do this? Well, look at what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians. This gives us some examples of how we model this lifestyle. Look what he says starting in, in chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians, starting in verse 3. It says, we live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us, and no one will find fault with our ministry. In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure trouble and hardship and calamities of every kind. We have been beaten, been put in prison, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, and gone without food. We prove ourselves by our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness, by the Holy Spirit within us, and by our sincere love. We faithfully preach the truth. God's power is working in us. We use the weapons of righteousness in the right hand for attack and the left hand for defense. We serve God whether people honor us or despise us, whether they slander us or praise us. We are honest, but they call us imposters. We are ignored even though we are well known. We live close to death, but we are still alive. We have been beaten, but we have not been killed. Our hearts ache, but we always have joy. We are poor, but we give spiritual riches to others. We own nothing and yet have everything. See, all of that. He, he's, he's echoing the, the sentiment that Jesus was saying. I mean, look what he says in that, that last verse. How can you own nothing and yet have everything? Well, how does one be meek and inherit the earth? It's a paradox. And the way that these work together is we see we, two different realities colliding with each other. On the one hand, see, Jesus tells us we have to die in order to live. Now, does that mean that we should go jump off a bridge and hope something good happens? Of course not. It means we have to die to ourselves spiritually so that we can come alive in all areas of our life. In the same way, our hearts can ache, but we can always have joy. It's, it's those two different realities, the tension between those that we live in as believers. I mean, think about it. As Christians, we understand that our life makes no sense. And we live in the reality where we understand that we are nothing and we have nothing in and of ourselves. But at the same time, as believers, we possess everything and are loved infinitely. 
See, somebody who understands the calling to live a Christ-like lifestyle gets that. They get the fact that I bring nothing to the table. I'm broken and sinful. That's why Jesus was explaining in the previous couple of verses, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We understand our own spiritual condition, but then we also understand the same at the same time, even though I didn't deserve it, even though I am unworthy, even though in my broken condition, I've received everything because of what Jesus did for me. It's in him that I've got it all. And that's the understanding that every believer comes to. We understand we do nothing, we bring nothing that we can offer to Christ, that we somehow deserve something from him. Because it's not about us in any way, shape, or form. It's all about what Jesus has done for us. And that's that, that tension we live with all the time, that we exist not for our, our own pleasure, our own satisfaction, but as Christians, we serve at the pleasure of our Savior. And we, we live and we work and we play for God's glory, not our own. We learn to model and live with humility, the same kind of humility that Jesus modeled. Well, what kind was that? Well, look what it says in Philippians 2. Starting in verse 6, it says, Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to its own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. I mean, think about what that's saying right there. Our ultimate example of what humility looks like, you have Jesus who was, and I love the way it says it right there. It says he did not view equality with God something to be grasped in some translations. He didn't have to wish to be like God or to be equal with God. Why? Because he was. He is. He is in every way God. And yet Jesus willingly allowed himself to leave his place of heaven, be clothed in human flesh, and live among us, feel human emotion, feel human pain, and then without sinning, he allowed himself to be unjustly taken prisoner, beaten beyond recognition, and then hung on that cross to pay a price for my sin and for your sin. At any point in time, had he chosen, I don't want to do this, he could have stopped it. Meekness is power under control. It's knowing that you could do something, but choosing not to, because by choosing not to, you're doing the greater good. And Jesus understood that reality, that we benefit because he humbled himself and was willing to do something he didn't deserve and receive punishment that he didn't earn to take away my punishment that should have been mine and yours that should have been yours. The ultimate in humility, the ultimate in sacrifice. See, that is our example as believers. And that's why when we, when we see injustice happening all around us, our example is not to go off and just let, let's try to fight everybody. It's to love people. Well, when they spit on us, keep loving them. We don't respond in kind. When they ridicule us, keep loving them. That was the example Jesus gave. He wept for the city of Jerusalem. His heart broke for the, the people in his world. And he could have stopped. He could have removed all the, the bad people. He could have ended all the conflict. But that would have been a temporary fix. We know one day there's going to be a permanent solution. And God's going to wipe away every tear. He's going to end every sorrow. And there'll be no more pain. 
There'll be no more death. He's going to bring everything to completion. But until that time, our mission as believers is to live as Christ in our communities, in our cities. And most of the time, that means that we're going to go in direct opposition to what the world says we should be doing. And it's not going to make any sense to them. And our response is, our example is to be like Christ. In whatever form that looks like. That's what we want to see happen. We want to be church, a church filled with people who have been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who have understood their own unworthiness. See, a big part of our the biggest part of the issues we have in our world is, is pride issues. People thinking that they're somehow better than they really are. And that, that has no bearing on color of skin. It has nothing to do with that. People of all creeds, colors, nations suffer from a sin problem. And the only solution is Jesus. Jesus. There's no other hope. And the only way they're going to get to that point is if the church will get out of its building and tell them. And that may mean we have to go into some difficult places and some scary situations. And it's going to cost us something. Just like it did Jesus. And we have to decide beforehand, are we willing to pay that cost? Are we willing to allow our reputation to suffer? Are we willing to maybe be physically injured for standing up for what we know God would want us to stand up for? And and these are all difficult questions because it's not, there's no one way to do any of these things. But as we try to navigate this, as we try to walk in wisdom through seasons that our our nation is going through right now, we want to be the church as God would have us be the church. We want to let everybody know that, that our community right here, everyone is welcome here. Every, every language, every color, every ethnicity, all of that are welcome in this space because none of us are worthy. All of us need the same Savior. We want people to know that's what we're about. And that's one of the things that, that I think that for far too long, the church has been known strictly for what we're against. And it's time the church started to be known what we're for. And we want to be for people all people but the only way we can truly love people in the right way is if we've let Jesus transform us from the inside out if we've gotten to a place in our lives where we've come to the realization where we know we're sinful broken people and that the only hope for that is nothing we can do ourselves but what Jesus did on that cross 2,000 some odd years ago and we put our faith in that. And we, we realize that apart from that, we've got nothing. That's where our strength comes from. That's where our hope comes from. It's all from that relationship with Jesus flowing through us. That's what we want to show a lost and hurting world. We want them to know that this building in here is where we gather. And this building is just a building, but it's a place where people can be introduced to the only one that can really bring hope and healing. The only one that can truly save anyone is Jesus. It's not a denomination. It's not a, you know, a bunch of rules and religious traditions. It's a relationship with Jesus. And as we, as we listen to the, the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek. 
for they will inherit the earth. That makes no sense compared to what the world says. Because usually the meek get nothing. They get overlooked. They get run over. They get left behind. But not in God's economy. Blessed are the meek, the one who fights for what's right when it pertains to others, but allows himself to stay under control when we get attacked. We model the example of Jesus, but the only way we can do that is if we know Jesus. And right now, we're getting ready to sing. You're going to have an opportunity to begin a relationship with Jesus. If there's somebody watching online, if there's somebody in this room who right now, if you were honest, you say, you know, there's never been a time in my life where I've said yes to Jesus, where I've put my faith and trust in him like the Bible teaches, where I've admitted that I'm a sinner. Just like the Bible says, and that my sin deserves punishment in the form of death but that Jesus took my place when he died on the cross for me. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you're saved. And we know there are people watching. There may even be people in this room that need to do that today. This is your time to make that right.